Hello, my name is Sean Boyle, and I'm going to show you how to rebuild this Mercedes 722.6 transmission, also used in many Chrysler products. This is referred to as the NAG transmission in uh, Chrysler Dodge Jeep vehicles. And if you head to automotivetextbook.com, find the link on there that says Automatic Transmissions Course Curriculum, you're going to find this video, of course, and you're also going to find a few other videos, videos that cover the theory and operation, the mechanical, hydraulic, the electrical side, you're also going to find this workbook. This workbook pretty much is the step-by-step -step procedure on how to overhaul this. It has specs in it, pictures. It was prepared by Alex Hankies, revised by Frank Travaglio, and also by Tyler Kovac and then myself. So it's up there for free. You can use it to kind of guide you along if you overhaul one of these transmissions. Also up on that automotivetextbook.com website, you're going to see videos on various transmissions from 6L80s to Hondas to ZF transmissions and many more. And you're also going to see a basic introduction series, a seven-part series where I cover the introduction to planetary gear sets and valve bodies and torque converters and hydraulics and electronics and all that kind of stuff. So if you're new to transmissions or you want a refresher on it, visit that site. And when you click on those links, they take you to YouTube videos similar to this one where I cover either in-depth basic stuff or in-depth um, unit-specific stuff. So... Anyway, that's that little plug for that. So we're going to jump right into this NAG transmission. So let me start by giving you a brief introduction to this transmission. Obviously, the torque converter is going to fit right in here. There's an input shaft and its splines. Rotate this around. We've got a cooler fitting here. This is an identification tag. And on that tag, you're going to have things like the chain date, the build year, some of the important information that you're going to want uh, when you try to identify this unit, especially if it's a core. And this is the shift mechanism right here that the shifter linkage is going to hook up to. This is where our drive shaft is going to bolt up to. If you take a look, I've got a 12-point nut right there, and it's staked. And it's got this little shank right here to help center the drive shaft. So you're going to need a deep well 12-point 30-millimeter socket to take that off. This is our pass-through connector right here, and this is our connection to the harness of the vehicle. Another cooler line fitting. Take a look, I've got these little bolts right here kind of tightened up and pinched in. And it's because when I roll this transmission over onto its back to do things like pull the valve body, you know, pull the oil pan and all that kind of stuff, it's going to keep this transmission stable so it's not rolling around because it's a rounded bell housing right here. And here's our vent. So that's what we see on the outside. So let's just jump straight into it, start pulling this thing apart. Now before I spin this over, I'm going to go ahead and take a 7 millimeter socket and there's a tiny little bolt in there. I'm going to pull this pass-through connector out. I'm also going to unstake this nut and put the transmission in part so the output shaft doesn't spin. I'm going to go ahead and take the nut off and pull the companion flange out. I've got superhuman strength, so I don't need an impact or a half-inch ratchet. I can do this myself. Actually, I, this is already apart, so I didn't really tighten it up very tight. Now I'm going to roll it over onto its back. I'm going to, move, I'm going to roll it my direction because I don't want to roll it over my shift linkage and bend that lever. So as you can see, it positions it nice, so it's easy to work on. I'm going to go ahead and first take off the oil pan. That was easy. Now with the oil pan off, I can go ahead and pull the filter out. And I've got 10 T27 Torx bolts to pull. When you take your detent spring off, this pin might come with it. This pin centers the top and the lower valve bodies together. And you want to make sure you don't lose it, so kind of put it off to the side. You'll use it when you reassemble the valve body. All right, now we're going to valve body up and out of the way. And we're going to look at this last. We're going to go through and rebuild this transmission, take it apart, put it back together. I'm just going to push this off to the side for now. Uh, it's an engineering marvel, so it kind of deserves its own little attention. So it's nice. We can pull it out in a complete fashion like this, and we'll put it off to the side. And like I said, towards the end of this video, and then there's going to be a separate video also just on the fixes and and um, up, updates that the aftermarket's done for this transmission or for this valve body in particular. So we'll get into this a little bit later. Now that we got the valve body off, we can see a few things in here. This is where these two speed sensors will pick up off of, and that's the N2 and N3 speed sensor. We need two speed sensors because there are times when this front speed sensor hole right here, the little windows that they read off of, they don't spin, uh, like in first and fifth gear. If you also notice, these passageways here kind of deliver fluid to and from the valve body, uh, into the oil pump, and then to the different clutches. And while we're talking about that, take a look at these holes. They're kind of goofy shaped. 
They're not perfect circles, so it's a little bit more difficult to air test these clutches right here pushing in through the, uh, like through these passageways, unless you have some kind of a plate with a gasket where you can go in there and do that with, which you could make something like that and be pretty easy to do. But we'll just air check these clutches as we go back together with it. So, um, you know, we'll be pretty confident in the clutches by air checking them individually as we put them together. And in the back, where it's pretty much a similar setup there, we've got some oblong holes, so it's a little bit more difficult to air check. But yeah, but this is how fluid gets into these clutches and applies them. Now, if you take a look, I've got two more bolts back here. These are T45s, and they're going to hold in this rear uh, B2 clutch housing. I'm going to go ahead and pull these out now. I could wait till a little bit later to do that, but I'm just going to go ahead and do that now. So the neat thing about this transmission is I'll lay it on the bell housing and I'll build it up right on the bell housing like a tower. But before I do that, I have to pull all these bolts out from the inside. There's quite a few. Some T45s and some T27s. The T45 bolts were really the only ones I needed to pull. The T27 bolts that I pulled around this little circle here, those hold on the B1 clutch housing and I will end up having to take those off later. So I went ahead and took them off now. So I'm gonna go ahead and flip this up on its bell housing. At this point, we're pretty much gonna work on this thing as a tower right here. So now there are two more bolts that I have to take off. These are the last two that hold the rest of this case onto the bell housing, T45s. Now for the moment. So that took our case off of this little tower of gear set and beauty right here but we still have left inside the, this portion of the case. On the inside there is the B3 clutch, the B2 clutch, and the B2 clutch housing, and the B3 piston, and a parking pole, a couple other little pieces. So for the sake of this video, I'm gonna go ahead and pull the B3 clutch out, the B2 clutch housing, all that good stuff, and we're gonna go take it apart and put it back together. We're gonna do that even before we get into the rest of this. That is not necessarily how you do it in the real world, in the real world, you disassemble this whole transmission, clean everything up, inspect everything, order your parts, and then start building it. Here we're going to do a little different just because this is for the sake of training. As I take something off, I'm going to disassemble it, talk about it. We're going to put it back together, do the measurements, and then move on to the next piece. So since this is the first part I really took off, we're going to dig deep into this. So first thing I'm gonna to need to do is go in there and get the big snap ring out that holds on the B3 clutch assembly. So here's our clutch assembly for the B3 clutch. The B3 clutch is used in reverse, only reverse. The, they got two reverse options in this and it's used in reverse options. So we got the big snap ring. We got the big old backing plate. Then the combination I have here, and I think this is the only one they've got, it looks like I've got five frictions, five steels, and a dish plate. And the dish plate has the dish kind of curling up on the outside, kind of like if you thought of this as your dinner dish that you're eating spaghetti on, or um, whatever your favorite meal is. So you'd have the dish facing up, right? So food doesn't fall off on the outside. So when they say stuff like dish facing up, they're talking like as if your dinner dish is facing up. The dish is facing down, that would be it curling down. Your food would go everywhere, so that would be good. Um, anyway, for some reason, students get sometimes confused on that terminology, so I like to kind of uh, relate it to something that everybody does. Well, most everybody eats food off of a dish. But Okay, now, since I've got those two bolts already removed from the inside here, those two T45s, I can go in there and I could pull out the B2 clutch housing. See? It's right there. Then also, before I get too carried away with other things, this is the parking pole mechanism. It splines to the output shaft. Get on there. And then these are shims that adjust the output shaft and play. So those are important, don't mix those up. And this shim just kind of fell out. It lived, probably should mention this, it lived on the other side of this bearing right here. There's a seal right there and there's a bearing. And what it does, 
It's a little thrust washer for our companion flange. So if you look, these are all also pretty close to the same size. They're the same, really are the same size. So pay attention, the one that comes apart, which ones went where. If you look, I had two shims on my output shaft, or, or for my, yeah, my output shaft end play. And then I just had this one thrust washer shim. So now I'm gonna show you how this works. Disclaimer, this is not what you're supposed to do in the real world. Um, I'm gonna put a little bit of air pressure into this. Now there's nothing wrong with air testing a clutch as long as the piston is working against clutches and it's pretty much applying a clutch like it's gonna do in the transmission. But the B3 clutch assembly is right here. It's not in there anymore. You know, this snap ring holds it into that case that I took out of the way. So there's nothing for this piston to work up against. So if I just went in there and blasted air into that, this piston could go a lot further than it normally would go and it might dislodge a seal, in which case you lose pressure and the piston returns, spring slams it back, cuts the seal, and oh, it's horrible. But I'm gonna do it anyway. So I just wanna show you just a little bit of air pressure in there and kind of show you how this piston works. So we've got our air, these are the bolt holes right here that um, bolted it to the case and I've got these other oil passages. Some of them are lubrication, some of them apply the clutch. And I'm just gonna put a little bit of air pressure in this one. You can see this applies the clutch in here. I can actually air check that one full blast. There's nothing wrong with that. Cause it's working up against that snap ring. And it's a good thing to air check it. That's how you know if your seals are leaking or not. So you wanna do that. Now this one right here See, it moves this whole housing on the outside. That applies the B3 clutch that's living above it. I wouldn't want to sit there and blast too much pressure into this because I'd overextend this piston. This piston wouldn't normally move more than maybe an eighth of an inch. But I can kind of air check it as long as I put a little bit of air into it and it holds. I know my seals are good. That's good information to know. Boy, this looks sketchy over here, doesn't it? It's like, whoa. It'll be all right. This all air checked pretty good, but hey, we're rebuilding it, so we're gonna go ahead and put new seals in it and uh, inspect everything. Next step is gonna be removing the snap ring that holds the B2 clutches in. So this is the B2 clutch, and there are different configurations depending on the transmission you've got and the size engine that goes in front of it and all that stuff. These are double-sided friction, so I got my big old backing plate. And then the friction discs have friction material on both sides. You'll see a lot of these transmissions will sometimes have friction material only on one side. One thing that's kind of interesting is it's usually the other way around. Usually the friction discs have the internal splines and the steel discs have the external splines, but it's the opposite on this transmission. So, and on the end, we actually do have a steel plate with external splines. So it's all kind of uh, breaking rules and doing things a little differently, but that's all right. Once again, we have a dish plate and it's dish facing up or it's facing towards the snap ring or towards you when you're taking it apart. So now I got to go in and compress this diaphragm spring right here so that way I can get in and get that snap ring out. Now one thing I'm gonna do before I take this apart is I'm gonna put in a not important area here, I'm gonna take my pencil or my pick, I'm gonna put a scratch mark all the way down this. And the reason why I'm doing that is because this piston assembly and housing can only fit into the case really in one way. Obviously, we have to have these bolt holes line up to the case, and these little splines have to line up in their little spot. You can see there's kind of a window here that kind of locates it. But the problem is, is that these two parts are not connected. So when I take it apart and go back together with it, if I have it clocked different, it's going to give me a pain in the butt, and it's, it's not easy to spin these parts once they're together. That diaphragm spring in there puts so much tension on it and the seals and so forth. So I'm just going to go ahead and put a little scribe mark on it and then I'll line my scribe marks up back up when I'm putting it together and that'll be good. Now to compress this piston, I'm gonna use my trusty, handy, faithful old screw press that I've used a million times. Uh, now I do use this tool quite a bit when you, I use the screw press, if you've ever watched my other videos. And I will use it here for this piston, but for a lot of the pistons in this transmission, I need to get creative and I, have to find different things. I can't use this. But I've come up with stuff and you'll see them later on. So I got my snap ring out and then there's a, re there's a retain. 
So I got my snap ring out and there's the retainer. And that retainer's got a couple unique things. It's got this little tab sticking out and it's got these two little ears. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna take this piston here and locate it. You see there's where the tab fits in and these are little ears. And it locates the piston so it's in the proper spot in the housing. And why might you ask they do that? It's because there's this little bleed orifice there that gets the air out when they fill this clutch up. That they don't want this to be anywhere but the 12 o'clock position because they want the air to kind of squeeze out. Pretty smart. So the way this, is, this piston return spring is constructed, I've got this diaphragm spring and I've got this retainer that fits on it. And the inside of this retainer is going to be the contact surface for that diaphragm spring. So you want to inspect those. I'm going to go ahead and pop these pistons apart using air pressure. I'm going to start with the B2 piston, then I'm going to move to the B3. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. There we go. So this is the B2 piston assembly, and on the inside of this piston assembly, we've got another little piston. This is a balance piston. It's gonna allow pressure to live on both sides, and it kind of helps keeps this piston released when they don't have it applied. And that's where that little retaining ring tab fit into, and that held that bleed orifice there in the 12 o'clock or thereabouts position. Uh, when we overhaul the transmission, we're gonna wanna go through and replace all the seals. You can see this outside seal here is a D-shaped seal. Place it on the outside of that balance piston, we got a D-shaped seal, and there's a second one there, so there's two of those. So go through and make sure you change these seals and these will be all good. Of course, you wanna inspect the pistons for cracks and any other kind of damage too. And the housing that bolts to the case, we're gonna to wanna to go through and change the little seals. They got little O-ring seals right there, and just go through and inspect it to make sure there's no cracks. There's also a steel sleeve that some sealing ring, rings right on, on the inside there inspect those to make sure they're not grooved or damaged or to make sure the sleeve hasn't spun. You can see they crimp the sleeve on in a few different spots so it's not likely that it'll spin but it's still something you want to inspect. So these parts all look pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and put it back together. If you remember I put scry marks on these pieces so I want to line those back up. There's my little scry mark. Also if you remember talking about, I hope you remember, that that little tab right there lines up with that little notch, and then these little ears line up with those little ears. And those ears are offset, they'll only fit in one spot, so like it'll only go on in that direction right there. You can spin these parts once you get them in, but it's a lot harder to spin, and why well, fight it if you can just line things up and uh, on your way in. The little inner fingers are facing up on that Belleville spring. Now here's a little something that makes you scratch your head. If you stop and take a look at this top friction disc, they get friction material on the top and it goes up against this backing plate. But both of these have external teeth. So there's never gonna be a movement between these two parts. It's not even gonna serve a purpose as far as a friction element because there's never any movement between these parts. And if we go down to the bottom of this clutch assembly, same thing, the very first plate is a steel plate, external teeth, and the very first friction has external teeth, but the very bottom, this friction surface never does anything up against that steel plate. So that to me kind of seems like a really, it's this acts, this has five friction discs, but really acts like four, because we lost two friction surfaces. I would expect a little better out of this German engineering. At this point, we can check our clutch pack clearance, and it doesn't feel too bad, but now if we follow the instructions in the service manual, they're gonna have us go through a special process. They want us to go through and use this special tool it has this little line right there. And when you push down, you can see this moves. There's a spring in there. And when you push down on this thing, that line is going to become flush with the top of this piece right here. And 
apparently that's about 1,200 newtons of force, which in America, we would call that 270-ish pounds. So it's going to put a, a lot of force on that piston. And what do you think it's going to do? Well, why is it doing that? Flattening out that little dish plate that's in there, kind of taking it out of the equation. And why would they want to do that? Think of it this way. If this transmission had 150,000 miles on it and that dish plate that's down there and say it normally occupies maybe 100 thousandths of clearance, it might have flattened out some over life. It might be 80 thousandths of clearance. Well, that means if I measure this, my clutch back clearance with just kind of measuring it like this would be 20 thousandths more. But that's not taking into consideration the total volume of piston movement because that wave plate will only flatten out so much. It's still going to flatten out the same amount, whether it's brand new or kind of flattened a little bit. So here's the thing. Not, not everybody's going to have this fancy little tool. Couldn't we just leave the wave plate out, measure this clearance, and then take the thickness of that wave plate and subtract it from whatever I just measured? Wouldn't that be doing the same thing? Let's find out. First, I'm going to go ahead and measure it just the way it is with this wave plate in there. Maybe this will work as a reference for somebody that's just lazy and doesn't want to do all the other stuff. I'll zero out my dial indicator. Now, I'm going to push down on this because one thing that using this tool would do that this method might not do as well is it takes out any of the irregular... This method would take out any of the irregularities. If I got a slight waviness to a steel or to a friction, it would take that into consideration because it's putting 270 pounds of force on it. So I'm going to go ahead and push down on it a little bit with my hands. Because I can see that takes up about 10 thousandths right there. And then I'm going to lift up on it. You can see I'm probably getting close to 50 thousandths of clearance on this. So I'm going to go ahead and take it apart. Leave the wave plate out. Put it back together without the wave plate. And we'll do that same measurement. The service manual also has you use a feeler gauge to do a lot of these measurements. And... Some of these clutches, there's very little space to get a feeler gauge between a snap ring and the actual plate. So that's, that makes it difficult as well. Now when I do this, I'm going to lift it up real high because I want to make sure the snap ring is seated all the way up in its little groove there. Okay, and we'll go through and see what kind of measurement we got here. Now, you're going to want to measure this in a few different spots. All right, negative 5... 160, 165, 0, 60, negative 5 to 60, so 165 thousandths. And this wave plate is about 75 thousandths, so if I'm saying I got about 165 thousandths, do the math real quick. There's one, carry the one, 165 minus 75, 90 thousandths of an inch of clearance. So I got 165 with no dish in there. The dish is 75 thousandths. If I put it in there and flat, that would be 90 thousandths. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and try it using the special tool and see how close just leaving the wave plate is. Now when you're using this special tool, you tighten it up until that line matches the top of this tool. And I'll tell you what, when you do this, you can kind of feel this screw stop. I think that's like pretty much exactly the same spot as where the wave is, is completely flattened out. So that probably takes 270 pounds to flatten that wave out. Go figure. And once you measure the clearance between the plate and the snap ring, probably should have paid attention. It could have gotten that further out of the way, but not pay attention. I got 90 thousandths using the method that I recommend and so we're going to kind of start around there and see how it feels. I'm going to have to stack my feeler gauges up. It's like only one spot I can measure this on where this little missing tooth is. There's a little slot there and it's a little, a little bit bigger. Oh I, I can jam that in. I'd say I probably really should probably have like an 88 or an 87 thousandths feeler gauge so it probably doesn't have quite 90 thousandths of clearance but you know what? Leaving the wave plate out got us within a few thousandths of an inch of what it is. We'll go ahead and install this into the transmission case a little bit later, maybe when we're putting things back together. Let's move over to this big honking thing. 
This transmission is awesome. You can take it apart and build it pretty much right up with bell housing. You don't need any special stands or fixtures. It comes apart and goes back together pretty quick and easy. So it's a kind of a builder's dream as far as taking these transmissions apart and rebuilding them. I'm going to go ahead and put these off to the side. That's the parking pall with its uh, end play shims. And I can grab this out and I can pull this assembly out right here. On this assembly, I've got my K3 clutch. I've got my rear gear set, my middle gear set, my output shaft. Pulls right out, nice and easy. First, we'll take off this retaining ring and old safety glasses, good thing. This retaining ring retains this washer and re um, a couple races for our Torrington bearing. And this washer is selective, so that way we can adjust our rear gear set end play. So that pulled out our K3 clutch housing and these two sun gears, the rear and middle sun gear assembly. On the inside of this, we also have our F2 sprag. And you can see the way the sprag works, it's gonna freewheel in one direction and hold in the other direction. In front of the transmission, aiming towards you, this is the middle sun gear, this is the rear sun gear. The outer sun gear should rotate in the clockwise direction and hold in counterclockwise if that sprag is assembled correctly and doing its job. I'm going to go ahead and pop my K3 clutch off of there. Let's take a look at this K3 clutch first. Pull the snap ring off. Clutches, you can see, just like all the others, I have a dish plate with the dish facing up. Then I have my friction steel. Now these are single-sided frictions. So on one side it's steel, on the other side it's a friction disc. This is one of those that's difficult to get this diaphragm spring out because there's not many things that are going to fit in there to compress that spring. And it, I can't just push down with the screwdriver because that's a special snap ring. It's kind of like an L-shaped snap ring. We'll see that when I take it out. So what do I use? You can go down to the hardware store and get yourself a little bit of this uh, thin-walled 4-inch PVC pipe. And uh, it fits perfect. Now, PVC pipe is not the most structurally sound uh, stuff. So if this piston return spring had a lot of tension on it, I wouldn't be using it. But it doesn't. It's not going to be too bad. Um, it's actually pretty easy to move down. Now this isn't a perfect fit, so it's still going to fight me a little bit to get the snap ring out. I might have to nudge this uh, PVC pipe around to, to get access and give me room to get that snap ring out. But I can feel it. I'm using my hand on the screw press, not putting too much force on it. And I can feel i have pressing the spring nicely. Feels good. Feels real good. Now I got room to go in there and get that snap ring out. If I was smart, I would have left the opening over here so it'd be easier to work with. I usually use one of these 45 degree picks and a 90 degree pick to kind of work, work it as soon as I get it out of its groove and use the 90 degree to help pull it up the rest of the way. So here's that little snap ring. It's got kind of like an L shape to the end of it. It is designed to kind of cup, wrap around here and kind of hug that diaphragm spring lock it into its little groove. When you go back together with it, you gotta make sure there's a little bit of a space around it so that way when you compress it, it pops in. I actually have another piece of home improvement tooling or supply that helps me assemble this. I'll show that to you here in a second. Here's the piston for this K3. It also has a D-shaped seal. And you're like, whoa, where's the inner seal? Huh, mystery. It's not in there, it's not in there. It's actually on the sun gear shaft. They're in there. Trust me, I'll show you here in a second. So we inspect this piston for cracks and damage and always replace the seals. This is one that this transmission is kind of notorious that the K3 piston seal kind of shrinks and it becomes flush or even below the surface of its groove and then the K3 clutch doesn't apply. So definitely replace the seal when you go back together with it. I'm gonna go ahead and put it back together, push that piston in there Got to be gentle with it. Now this tool right here is going to be a pretty cheap special tool that's going to be really nice. This is a, an adapter, four inch adapter to hub spigot. I'm going to go ahead and put this spring in there. And I'm going to put my, my L-shaped snap ring in there. Make sure it's kind of centered. And then I'm going to take my spigot tool or PVC pipe and push down it, listen for it to click. Ooh, that sounds 
bad, but it's good. Not bad meaning bad, but bad meaning good. We're gonna do this with every clutch, so hopefully this doesn't bore you, but I'm gonna go ahead and build it up without the wave plate, and we'll compare it to the special tool, because they have used the special tool on every one of these clutches except for the B3 clutch. They want you to flatten out that wave plate using that uh, 1200 newton meters and that special tool, all that stuff. We're gonna go ahead and do it using the Sean method of leaving the wave plate out, putting the snap ring in. I can't say it was, I'm sure other people do this too, but without doing something like this, you never know if your clearances are good because you have to compare them to the spec in the book and the spec's expecting you to push down and put 1200 newton meters or newtons onto that clutch. All right, once again, I'm gonna try this in a few spots. I've got, zero this out, zero. And it goes all the way around. I'm gonna say 165. Try it in another spot. Zero, 165. Measure my wave. And I've got 60, so this is 105 thousandths of an inch of clutch pack clearance as I measured it. And the spec for this, for a 10 disc setup, is 99 to 114 thousandths. Got that written to memory. And um, so if I took my 165, subtracted my 60 thousandths, I have 105. I'm within spec, this is good. Before going through and using a special tool, it looks like a little over 60 thousandths for all you lazy people. Got that line to the top. So I got 105, so I'm gonna try to make that up with my feeler gauges. And I've gotta get between, this is one of those that's difficult because I gotta kind of flex my feeler gauges. I'm gonna try to get my screwdriver in there and make sure that plate's Snap rings lifted up. Flex my feeler gauges. That, that's about it right here. And I'm getting about the exact same measurement that I did when I measured without the wave plate. So it's looking like uh, you don't need this tool as long as you take the wave plate out. Okay, so that was my K3 clutch assembly. It's all good. I'm gonna air check a little bit later. I'll air check it when we go back together with everything. I guess in reality, probably should do it now, but I don't know. I'm just gonna do it later. Now there is a, a retaining ring down in here. Probably should take those O-ring seals off before trying to take these uh, out, the retaining ring, because you might damage the O-ring seals. Here's our middle sun gear in the shaft, and we got a couple O-rings, like I said, that we'd want to change those out. Also want to go through and check the surface right here where the sprag rides to make sure that it's all good, it's not all uh, gouged up, or there's no um, burnelling, little railroad track type impressions in it. Uh, look at the gear surfaces. Make sure you can see through the middle okay. Make sure <laughs> make sure the lube holes are all opened up. Make sure the splines are all good. There's a lot of little things to check. Pretty much, you pretty much have to be on every little part in this transmission. And like this is the F2 Sprague assembly. To change it out you would just pull the snap ring out and the F2 Sprague comes out. If you take a look, they actually do have an arrow on there. The arrow indicates the direction that the outer part is gonna lock when assembled correctly. And you would want to inspect the inside surface of the sun gear too, because the other element, the other side of the sprag elements are gonna ride up against that surface. You wanna make sure they're not brunelled up or scored or damaged at all. This one looks pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this back together. This, uh, this one looks really good because it's a never seen a single mile of use on it. This is a training unit that I got from uh, Chrysler. Thank you, Chrysler. This is assembled correctly. This outer race or the rear sun gear should rotate clockwise and hold counterclockwise. And that's what it's doing. So I'm gonna go through and put my snap ring back in there. You might have a little slot there, but that's okay, that's normal. I'm gonna go ahead and put this together the rest of the way, just to kind of push it off to the side so it feels complete. Spin it to line up the frictions. This sticks out probably about an eighth of an inch, or a little more. And that's why we have this little raised section there to kind of cover that up. 
as far as the rest of this gear set is concerned, you do want to go through and inspect the you know, individual planets. You want to check their end play. You want to see if the gears rock side to side. That would not be good. Uh, go through and inspect the Torrington bearings. Inspect the internal gear, annulus gear, whatever the manufacturer wants to call it. And then here's our output planetary. It's the middle planetary gear. Same thing, end play. See if the gears rock. This all looks good. So for the sake of keeping everything cleared out, I'm going to go ahead and just put this assembly back together and off to the side. Now there is a clearance measurement that we're going to perform to make sure that this end plate is right and to see if this selective shim here is the right thickness. It should be between 6 and 24 thousandths of an inch. Here's my 24 thousandths. If it doesn't fit in there, which it doesn't, I can tell it wasn't going to fit in there. And then I'll find my 6 thousandths. So I should be able to fit a 6, but not a 24. And if I'm good between those two, then I'm good. Here's my 6. No problemo. So the end plate's good on this. I don't need to mess with that shim, which I wasn't expecting I'd have to. Moving on down the line, I'll bring this gear over. I'm going to go ahead and pull the input shaft out. This input shaft assembly, it has the rear internal gear, it has the K2 clutch assembly, it has a, the N3 speed sensor windows that we see right there. Um, it has the front planetary gear set in it too. So we're going to go ahead and take it apart. I'm going to push this back off to the side. Whoa. To get to this K2 clutch assembly, I'm going to have to take this uh, rear internal gear out, and it's just a snap ring. Here's my rear internal. You can see I can inspect it to make sure it's all good. Nothing wrong with it. So to get that out, I can slide my K2 clutch assembly out. And what I have is a Torrington bearing, kind of a front planetary gear set, another Torrington bearing. So I'd want to inspect these Torrington bearings the way I was inspecting the other ones. All looks pretty good. We're going to focus on taking apart this K2 clutch. Pull this snap ring out. So this clutch has six friction discs. Now on the inside of here, this one's retained a little different. Instead of having a normal snap ring, they have kind of like a circlip. So I'll have to compress this down to get that circlip out. There's not much force on the circlip, but it's still one of those things I'll have to use a little my little screw press and gain access to the opening of that circlip. Use a couple picks to pop it out. So there's our little circlip. And on the inside of this K2 drum, we're going to want to go through and change out our D-seal, kind of take a look and inspect this and make sure there's no cracks or anything obvious. Even check to see where the frictions or steels are contacting this drum to see if there's any um, deep grooves or anything like that that would cause this to be bad. And of course, welded to it, we also have our internal gear, our front internal gear, so we want to inspect that real close. Ceiling rings, once again, we got these plastic ceiling rings. A lot of techs do not like to change these because they've been burned by replacement ones, but they do come in the kits, so it's kind of builder preference. If there's nothing wrong with it, that's not really a wear item, so a lot of people leave them. A lot of techs will leave them. The K2 piston itself has a big old honking O-ring on the back of it. I want to change it out. In the middle, it's loud. In the middle, we've got our balance piston, which has got a big old O-ring on it. Um, it does not have an O-ring on the inside because the fluid is designed to kind of leak. Once it's in here, it kind of pushes out through the middle where the stuff is and all that stuff. So now on this piston right here, I've got this diaphragm spring right there. You can see the outer edge of this diaphragm spring contacts this raised section that we have on this K2 piston. And these fingers are going to actually contact this section right here on this balance piston. There's nothing wrong with this setup, so I'm going to go ahead and just put it back together. Can't forget this big O-ring. It kind of falls off. doesn't really have an uh, O-ring groove that it fits in. Kind of gingerly press this whole assembly in there. And we're in with that a 
I'll just kind of roll that circlip in by hand. I'm going to go ahead and build the clutches back up in it. We'll check the clutch pack clearance like we have with the other unit. So I'm first going to leave this wave plate out. So this is the clearance with no wave plate installed. Zero to 80. So 180, 175. I'm going to go ahead and say 180 thousandths. So I'm getting 180 thousandths without the wave plate installed. And the wave plate is 70 thousandths. So the 70 thousandths wave plate taken away from the 180 thousandths that I measured, I'd have 110 thousandths of clearance. And this has the six friction set up on the uh, K2 clutch. And it's supposed to be between 106 and 122 thousandths. Once again, off the top of my head, I'm remembering that. So this falls within spec and it's kind of on the tight side, but it is still within spec. Now let's put our Fancy special tool on there. Okay, I'm gonna pull up on my snap ring. 109 bits in there. There's not much slop. I'm gonna say that there's probably 112 thousandths of clearance, maybe 114. The only reason why my measurements might be a little bit different than using this tool is because if every friction disc or steel plate's not perfectly flat, when I'm pushing down and lifting up, I'm not putting near as much force as this tool is. So this tool is really flattening not only the dish plate out, but it's also flattening out any waviness that exists in the frictions and steels. So it takes out a, a little bit more of the irregularities than I'll be able to do by hand, but you can see it's only a couple thousandths of an inch. So I don't think that's gonna mess up your reading too much if you don't use this tool. So I'm gonna go ahead and put all this back together since everything checks out okay. We'll call this assembly done. Slowly knocking down our tower here. The next one here is our K1 clutch. This K1 clutch assembly has the tone wheel for the N2 speed sensor, which is another input speed sensor. It also houses the F1 sprag. The F1 sprag is used to hold the sun gear in place when you're shifting from first to second and from fourth to fifth. It's really there at the backup because when you shift from first to second, what you're doing is you're releasing the B1 clutch, applying the K1 clutch. And there might be a moment there where the K1, which is supposed to drive the sun gear, is not driving it yet. And the B1 that's supposed to hold the sun gear is not holding it anymore and you get a flare. So this, uh, this sprag assembly is there to prevent that flare from occurring. So it's really only doing stuff during the shift. One thing that you'll notice between the B1 and the K1 clutch is they use the same snap rings. The frictions, the friction and steel setup between the K1 and the B1 are the same. Even the wave plate. With this configuration right here, I have 12 friction discs in this K1. Now this B1 here actually has eight. This time I was smart and I put the circlip openings facing me so I could see what I'm doing. There's my little circlip that held the piston in. I do have a D-shaped seal in here that I need to change out. And that right there is that F1 sprag. I'll pull that out in a second. Well, like the K2 clutch, we also have a balance piston in here. And that balance piston does have an O-ring on the outside. The little K1 clutch has a D-shaped seal right there. This F1 sprag right here is kind of known to cause issues. So I would recommend changing this for sure on any unit that you go through and inspecting the uh, inside of this K1 clutch drum where the sprag rides, inspect it real close, and also inspect the stator support where that sprag rides on. Make sure it's not destroyed, galled up. This is where the damage usually happens. Like the other sprag, they have an arrow indicating that the outer race, which in this case is the sun gear and the K1 drum, should lock in this direction right here when installed. So I'll put this all together. Start with the K1 
piston with its seals, fresh seals installed. Then I'm going to go ahead and put my diaphragm spring in. I want the fingers facing down, so it's dish up in this case. And then the balance piston, if you remember, the, the dish plate's going to kind of fit within this little slot there. Balls right in there. And there we have it. Piston installed, circlip installed, the F1 sprags installed. So we're going to go through and do our clutch measurement. I'm going to leave my wave plate out. Zero to a hundred. We'll call it 160. Zero, 162. Zero, 162. We'll call it 160 thousandths. And my wave plate is 55 thousandths. So if I take 55 thousandths from 160, I've got 105 thousandths clearance. And the K1 clutch for a 10 disc setup, it's supposed to be 110 thousandths. A little on the tight side here. Let's see what I get when I use a special tool. With this clutch setup, I'm supposed to get, because this has got 12 friction discs in there, I'm supposed to get between 114 and 130 thousandths of an inch of clearance. Now when I measured it without the dish plate in there, I was getting 160 thousandths. And the dish plate was 55 thousandths thick. So you subtract that from 160, I got 105. So I'm under spec by about 10 thousandths. So now with the special tool on there, putting 270 pounds of force, flattening out that dish plate that I put in there, and uh, I'm going to go through and do that same measurement. And so what I did is I stacked up 105 thousandths worth of feeler gauges here. And I'm going to see if I can fit those in to basically replicate what I measured before. So you can see I'm getting, there's, I can fit 105 thousandths feeler gauge. It's kind of nice. I got these little windows you can get in there. And it's about the right amount of drag. It might be a little bit more. I might have maybe 107 thousandths, but... I would say that this clutch is probably a little too tight and I'd want to change the snap ring on this. Um, let's measure how thick that snap ring is. So this snap ring is 126 thousandths of an inch thick. They do make a 114 thousandths and they also make 102 thousandths. So if I put the 114 thousandths, that would give me 12 thousandths more clearance. If I added 12 to 105, I would now have 117 and I'd be right within spec on the nice tight side of spec, which is where I'd rather be anyway. But since it's a lab unit, I'm not gonna order a new snap ring or anything like that. It'll all work fine anyway. So at this point, the K1 clutch is done. I'm gonna put it off to the side and we're gonna move over to the B1 clutch. And we're almost done with all the clutches in this transmission. I already got a head start on this one because I took the B1 clutch out to show you it's pretty much the same as the K1 clutch assembly. Um, but I do need to take these T45 bolts out now, if you remember from earlier on, uh, when I had this transmission laying on its uh, oil pan, I took a bunch of T27 bolts out from the bell housing side. Those bolts were going into this B1 clutch housing right here. So all I really had to do at this point is take these T45s out. And here I am, got it in my hand. I will be taking this diaphragm spring out. I've got a kind of a repurposed tool for that, and I'll show you that in a second. It's pretty cool. Uh, hopefully you have one laying around. If not, they're actually not that bad uh, to purchase. This is a kind of a rubber bonded gasket that separates the B1 clutch housing from the bell housing itself. And there's also the oil pump. When I took those T45 bolts out in the middle there, the oil pump housing, which is on the bell housing side here, will now be able to come out. There's an O-ring on there that kind of keeps it tight in there. So I'll have to give it a couple little taps right here. Now the difficulty with this B1 clutch is that there's not much room to compress this diaphragm spring down. So what makes life a little difficult are these little nubs that sit up on this piston. There's not much room to get anything in between the spring and the housing and all that. But what does work, this is kind of a lopped off one, two, three, four, apply drum on a 6L80. And would you look at that, man, it just fits perfect. Splines, the exact same spline count and everything. So this allows me to get in there with this little window cut out. And I also use this tool on a six, uh, 6T70 as the same thing as a diaphragm spring compressor. 
And this will allow me to push down and get my snap ring out with ease. Even if you had to buy this drum from the Chevy dealer, I think they're like less than 10 bucks or 15 bucks. They're not that much. So you could buy one just to destroy it and make a special tool out of it if you had to. Just like some of the other snap rings, this is kind of an L-shaped snap ring right there. And it's designed to kind of fit around the inside of that diaphragm spring. This is the only piston assembly in here that has molded seals on it. It's such a small little piston. There's not really much room to put a piston ring groove in there and to put like D-shaped seals. So they just have this bonded piston. So you'd replace this when it comes in a kit, inspect everything. So as mentioned to you before, this is the surface area that the F1 Sprag rides on. So you want to make sure you inspect that real close. You got a bushing right there, make sure that's in good shape. Uh, I just replaced that bushing. Um, more than likely that would be a good practice to do on this transmission. We got a scarf cut Teflon seal, a couple of them there separating the oil that finds its way into the K1 clutch housing. So you'd want to go through and change that too. And there's a little bearing in here, a roller bearing, and a Torrington bearing. So a lot to inspect on this piece right here. If there's any damage to it, you're going to be replacing this part. So we're all good. We'll just go ahead and reassemble this. Staying consistent, we're going to leave our dish plate out. Zero, looking at about 150. Got about 150 thousandths of movement. Since this wave plate is the same as the K1, we're expecting it to be about 55 thousandths, which it is. So the clutch pad clearance, as far as we're measuring it right now, is about 95 thousandths of an inch. And this is the eight friction disc, uh, single-sided friction setup. You're supposed to have between like 102 to 118 thousandths. So I'm measuring this at about 95 thousandths. So I'm a little on the tight side. We'll see if their special tool gives us a few more thousands of clearance. Okay, got the, got the line at the top. And I'll build up my feeler gauge setup. I'll see if it verifies it at 95 thousandths. Using a special tool, I can get about a hundred thousandths in there. This is probably on the borderline of the spec. Um, it would still probably serve itself uh, well to step it down one snap ring size. So now this B1 clutch was the last clutch in this transmission that we went through. The, the next step here is going to be to pop the oil pump out of this here, bell housing, so we can check it and do a couple measurements on it. If that all looks good, we'll start building it back up and we'll air check it as we go up. There is an O-ring around this oil pump, so even though you get all the bolts out, it just won't fall out. So through that opening in the case, I use a little screwdriver or something, tap on it and pop it out of there. It's a gear and crescent style. If you notice here, there's a couple things to pay attention to. One is it looks like you can install this either way and it probably wouldn't make much of a difference. The little lugs are kind of in the center. The little step that exists is on both sides. There's no chamfers or anything crazy like that. But I'd still mark it or do something to make sure you're assembling it the way it came out. The outer gear is a little different. They actually have an ID mark. If you look, there's sharp edges, square edges there. If I flip it over, the outer edge has a chamfer. So they want to make sure that chamfer fits into the pocket of the pump. And we're going to want to inspect the surface that these pump gears ride on to make sure they all look good. And there are really just a couple measurements that we do to this oil pump. They're going to have us check the clearance between this inner gear and the crescent. They're going to have us check how deep these two gears sit inside this pocket. And they're also going to have us check the clearance between this crescent and this inner gear while kind of pulling it in this direction here, like that. We'll look at that here in a second. But I'm supposed to check the from the cover of the oil pump down to the gear, and a two and a half thousandths feeler gauge should not fit between that. Of course, um, I should be able to move those gears, so obviously the gear should not be sitting up higher than the housing, but the two and a half thousandths feeler gauge should not fit underneath it, which in that case it doesn't. Actually, I'm allowed two and a half thousandths on the inner one and two uh, 27 ten thousandths, or 2.7 thousandths for the outer one, but 
I've got a two and a half thousandths feeler gauge. I don't have a 2.7 thousandths feeler gauge. So now I'm going to check the inner gear. And it passes both those tests. I'll go ahead and spin it. Just want to make sure that there is clearance, but it's not greater than roughly two and a half thousandths. Now the second measurement they'll have you do is you'll assemble the gears in there and one inch, 450 thousandths of an inch away from the edge of this crescent, they want you to make a mark. That's where I'm going to measure it. The next step is, is you pull this gear, so that tooth is in contact with the crescent, and I'm creating a gap right there. And a 33 thousandths feeler gauge should not fit in that gap. And mine is nowhere close to fitting in there. There is a gap there, but a 33 thousandths feeler gauge does not fit to that gap. That's a good thing. So as expected, this oil pump passed the test since there's nothing wrong with it. So we can go ahead and put it back together. Now there is an O-ring on the outside of this. You want to make sure that you've got your O-ring on there. And I'm going to drop this down in there. Now you could probably have these, like put some guide bolts in there to make sure everything's lined up perfectly. I'm going to live life on the edge here. Try to see if I can't get it close. If I have to, I'll nudge it. I'm not too far off, but I can see through these bolt holes here that I'm not perfectly lined up. So I'm going to go through and use a screwdriver and try to spin that in there and straighten it out. So I'm going to go back together with this by starting out with my, my little gasket that I've got here, my rubber coated gasket. And then now I'm going to reinstall my B clutch housing. There is a dowel pin and that has to line up with this hole right there. So if things aren't going in straight, you don't want to force it. There we go, that's in. And now I have to put my T45 bolts back in there. But don't forget to torque these. These get torqued to 177 inch pounds. Not foot pounds, inch pounds. As promised, while building this thing back up, we're going to go ahead and air test it. To check the B1 clutch, I have to put air into this passageway right there. Good seal. Now the next I'm going to go ahead and put my K1 clutch on, but the air check in, I'm going to take these Teflon seals out because they just don't like the air check very well. So I'm going to, I'm going to spin these Teflon seals out. I'm, going to, I'm replacing these with these accumulator piston seals from a 4L60E kit. I won't have to worry about leaking past those Teflon seals. Teflon seals do a great job when there's oil pressure and all that kind of stuff but they don't seem to do as good of a job when you're trying to air test something. Drop this in there. Those accumulator seals, they're a little bit tighter than your average fit. Got a pretty good tight seal there. So to give you an idea what it would air check like if I just had that Teflon seal in there, I can get it to apply by spinning it. But I still hear quite a bit of leakage and it's really all coming around those Teflon seals. Okay, so I got my B1 clutch housing in, my B2 clutch housing in. Next thing I'm gonna do, is put my K2 clutch housing in. Before I put my K2 clutch housing in, I want to air check it. I can apply my K2 clutch by plugging the hole on the other side of the input shaft, pumping air pressure into this passage right there, and that will apply my K2 clutch piston. Definitely a good seal. Now I could just drop this in there. I want to make sure I don't forget before I put my output gear set in, I've got that bearing race that fits right on the top of the input shaft. That might have fallen out when you were taking things in and out. So before I put the output shaft with the K clutch and assembly in there, I want to air check it. 
it's similar to what I just did with the uh, K2 clutch. I want to plug the hole in the back of the output shaft there. And I can put my finger in there and apply that clutch. Now this is something I really should have done before I put all this together. So I'm going to take it apart just to show it to you. I can air check this K3 clutch just by putting my finger on the back of the input shaft hole there. And notice how you can hear some of that leakage? Well, there's a good chance that's coming around those plastic ceiling rings that are in there. But if I want to make sure, I could take this apart, back apart. I know we don't like taking things apart that we just put together. And I can replace these two plastic ceiling rings with a couple O-rings that um, out of a just kind of a generic O-ring kit. Just like the Teflon ceiling rings, these plastic ceiling rings do a great job of sealing when there's oil in there and there's pressure behind it, but they just don't do as good of a job with air pressure. So what you can do is you can use some O-rings and just put them in there. These don't fit quite the best. I have to kind of massage them into the groove, but once they're in there, they seem to do a pretty good job. I'm gonna go ahead and put this K3 clutch assembly on there. Got the O-rings in their place. See if I can do this without hurting myself. Now I'll go ahead and air check with those O-rings and we'll see if it has a better seal. Ooh. Perfect. So now I have confidence that that clutch has got a great seal on it and I don't have to worry about it being a, a leak from the piston seals. So like I said, we just did that for the sake of doing an air test and making sure our piston seals are good. And they are. All right, we're getting close. It's building back up. I'm gonna go ahead and put my Output shaft with the K3 clutch and that middle and rear gear set. All those good parts, sit there and spin that in there. Ta-da. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the case and we're gonna drop that B2 clutch housing in there and the B3 clutch. We'll air check it and then we'll be ready to slide that over the top. We're almost back to where we started. There's a couple ways you can do this. I can put this parking pole in there and I can put my Thrust washers in there. They lay down on, top, on the on that bearing that's in the back of the case. Um, it's sometimes difficult to put the case on over this because those thrust washers there, those end place shims, like to catch that spline section there. So, what makes most sense because you're going to be changing the seal anyway, is you pop that seal out. You can see this seal's been kind of popped out and reused a million times because for training purposes, we don't need to buy a new one. And there's a uh, snap ring in there. The snap ring retains this rear case bearing. So we'll remove it. And this bearing will probably come out pretty easy. I mean, I don't know if they all come out that easy, but this, this one sure did. So that'll make life a little bit easier when we go back together with it. So now when I go back with this, I can kind of leave these shims off to the side because I can kind of put those on after the fact. But I do have to put my parking pawl assembly in there. Parking gear. Lay that in there. And then I can take my B2 clutch housing and I could drop it in as well. I don't know if I should drop it in, place it, gingerly lay it in there. Oh gosh, I kind of dropped it, didn't I? Now I'm gonna go ahead and peek, make sure I can get my bolts in there. These are the bolts that, remember, we have two bolts. These big guys right here, T47s, or T45s. And they will retain that housing into this case. So I'm gonna to wanna to put those on now. So it is a good sign when that, these bolts thread in, because that means that the housing and the piston were in alignment, so everything lined up when you went in. These get torqued to 144 inch pounds. All right, so we've got that installed. And now we have to take our B3 clutch. It's been sitting here. We'll build our B3 clutch up. This is the one clutch they don't make you use that pressure tool on there. You just go ahead and just measure 
You just measure it with a feeler gauge. So we got our B2 and B3 clutch. We're ready to take this whole assembly and slide it right over the top of our transmission. It might help to put the flange on there and spin the output shaft a little bit. So you can line up some of those B3 clutches. I'm going to go ahead and start these two bell housing bolts right up here. They'll keep everything lined up for me. Let's go ahead and we will put our selective shims in there for the uh, what you have to play. Then we're going to drop our bearing in there. We're going to put our Retaining ring back in. So next we're going to go ahead and put the thrust washer that goes between the companion flange and the output shaft to put it in. And I'm going to go ahead and put the seal back in. This one's wiped out, kind of been taken in and out about a million times. But it's training it, so we'll just push that in there. Normally you probably need to have a little seal driver. And then we've got our companion flange and our nut. You want to torque this down. This gets torqued down to 147 and a half foot pounds. So hopefully your torque wrench goes in half of foot pound increments. Oh, we are supposed to measure the end play here, the clearance. There's a little bit of movement we've got and that's expected. It's supposed to be there. Now, I don't have all the bolts on the bell housing Titan. I did snug these two up. So it'd probably still be a pretty accurate measurement. So we'll go ahead and see what kind of uh, end plate we've got here. I'm measuring about five thousandths. It's supposed to be between 12 and 20 thousandths. So I need about seven more thousandths of clearance. I could take it back apart and measure those shims, come up with a different combination of shims so I can get between 12 and 20 thousandths of end plate. So I can go ahead and call this portion of the transmission done. I'm gonna install all these T27 bolts. Those are for that B1 clutch support. I'm gonna also install my T45s, snug those out, torque them up. And then I'll be able to call this done and we will focus on the valve body next. So now we're at the valve body portion of this video and I'm gonna go ahead and take this valve body completely apart, pull the valves out, we'll identify what the valves do, we'll look at the solenoids, and we'll put it back together and then we're going to vacuum test it to see if it's all good and if any of those vacuum tests showed a failed result there's gonna be a separate video add-on to this that covers the improvements that they the aftermarket has done to this valve body and then involves either reaming or replacing valves reaming some bores out and kind of updating the uh, valve body so that way it works as good as new first i'm going to go ahead and take this these plastic covers off these covers are just kind of propped over the solenoids. The, in the vehicle, the valve body is kind of positioned as, as I have it. And I'll go, go around and kind of identify what we're looking at here. Um, these two are my pressure control solenoids. This is the, the line pressure control solenoid, and that's the shift pressure control solenoid. These three right here are shift solenoids. And this one right here is the one, two slash four, five shift solenoid. And this is the two, three shift solenoid. And that one there is the three, four shift solenoid. And this last solenoid, is the torque converter clutch solenoid for lockup. These two right here are input shaft speed sensors. This first one right here, the N2 speed sensor, it measures off that K1 clutch housing, and this K2 measures off the kind of the K2 clutch housing or the shell. This is that pass-through connector that has that seven millimeter kind of sleeve that we have to uh, disconnect and remove from the transmission before we can pull this valve body out. There's this little uh, plunger right here it's foam, and as fluid level raises in the transmission, this kind of pushes up against the, the hole that we've got in the transmission case. There's kind of like a drain back hole, or I don't know, just a big old hole. And uh, that's what kind of seals that off, and when fluid raises up in this transmission from expansion, when it heats up, it forces the fluid to kind of climb along the side of this, this little tunnel that we've got here on the inside of the transmission case. And that's also the reason why 
the fluid level changes so dramatically with temperature. And you'll see that if you look at the lecture that I've got on the mechanical operation of it, I kind of go through and talk about how the fluid level is um, uh, very particular and you want to make sure you use a temp gun or a scan tool to identify transmission fluid temperature when you determine your fluid level to see if it's okay. Anyway, that's in that lecture right there. Uh, another thing that we've got is we've got a thermistor here. This is a temp sensor, measures the transmission fluid temperature, and it changes resistance based off of the fluid temperature. Um, the neat thing about this is they've combined that with the park neutral switch. It's right here, this little switch. And you're like, well, wait a minute, why would they do that? Transmission temp sensor and park neutral switch. Well, they're trying to save some circuitry, some wiring, and they're combining the two. They figure you probably don't really need to know what your transmission temperature is when you're in park or neutral because there's no real load, there's no heat being generated for the most part. So what they've done is that when you are in park and neutral, it opens that circuit up so the TCM can look and say, oh, I don't have a transmission temp sensor signal, or I should say I don't have a valid signal, I must be in park or in neutral. And then when you shift into reverse or into drive, it's going to complete that circuit, and then the TCM is going to see a valid temperature sensor signal, and uh, it's going to use that temp sensor signal for its own functions, but it's also going to know that you're in a gear other than park and neutral. It's kind of neat that they've combined that. This whole assembly is what uh, Mercedes and, and um, Chrysler, uh, they refer to as the conductor plate. I'm going to go ahead and take these little clamps off to get the solenoids out, and then I can pull that conductor plate straight out. The solenoids just are kind of held in there by those little straps that push down on it. And you can see they've got these little prongs, and they fit into that conductor plate. All these solenoids are pulse width modulated, but these two solenoids right here are the ones that are really um, functioning constantly as pulse width modulation. So they do appear, they have the same part numbers on them. I don't know if I would want to interchange them if I'm rebuilding this thing. I'd probably keep them in the same spots. So that way if you've got any symptoms, you would know that it wasn't really due to you swapping solenoids around. The three shift solenoids are also pulse width modulated. I don't really know why they do that. Um, it's kind of interesting because these uh, they pulse with modulate these solenoids to limit current flow through them. But the reality of it is, is that they are only turned on for about a couple seconds to get the shift to start. And once the shift starts and completes, they turn them back off. And they don't modulate in a sense where they're changing pressure. They just really modulate it to control current flow through them. And once again, these are all the same part number, so theoretically they can be interchanged, but it's always a good practice to probably keep them in the same spots. And lastly, I got my torque converter clutch solenoid. It is also pulse width modulated to adjust the apply feel of my torque converter, and it's the only one that's like that, so you really can't get it mixed up between the other bunch. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull my conductor plate off. It does kind of snap into place over here, over by that temp sensor has a little something there to kind of click it onto that spacer plate. These are kind of known to fail, and especially our speed sensors. Some people have gone in and they've uh, done repairs to them, but a lot of people would just go through and replace this. So now I'm at a point where I'm going to go ahead and split these two valve body halves so I can start rebuilding them individually. And I've got a bunch of these T27 Torx bolts, so I'm going to go ahead and take those out. Well, that was easy. All right, so let's separate these valve body halves. We'll go ahead and put the top half of the valve body off to the side for now. This is the spacer plate, pretty stout spacer plate. It's even got these fancy little kind of machining marks on there. It's like waves. So before you tip it over and spill all these parts out, pay close attention to the valve body. I've got these two filter screens. I've got one, two, three, four steel check balls, one, two, three, four plastic check balls, this little check valve right there, then one, two, three, one, two, three, four steel check balls on that side. So looking at this half of the valve body, this first valve right here is the B2 shift valve, then I've got the 2-3 holding valve, the 2-3 command valve, the 2-3 shift pressure valve, 
the uh, TCC damper valve, which isn't apparently on every unit. And then we've got the torque converter clutch lockup regulator valve. So on this side of the valve body, we've got uh, various valves. And this first one right here is my 12-45 command valve. This one here is my 12-45 holding pressure shift valve. And this guy right there is my 1245 shift pressure valve. This, with its little sleeve, and there's actually a little valve on the inside there, is the 12 overlap valve. Um, and then this guy with this tiny little spring is my shift pressure regulating valve. Probably an important one. And this is my pressure control valve. And then this last valve that we've got right here is the shift solenoid pressure regulator valve. That's the one that knocks down pressure for our shift solenoids. Pretty important stuff going on here. So I'm gonna go through and use brake clean and clean all the residual oil off of this and then reassemble it so I, I can vacuum test. So now that this valve body's back assembled and clean, I'm gonna put it off to the side because we'll vacuum check both halves of the valve body together. And now I'm gonna go ahead and disassemble the upper valve body half. So I got my valve body completely disassembled. This is the upper valve body. Everything on this side of the valve body is over here on the organizing tray. Everything on this side of the valve body is over here on the organizing tray. So I'm going to go ahead and identify what these valves are, and then we'll put it back together, clean it all up, and then we'll vacuum test it. On this side of the valve body, I've got my manual valve, then I've got my 3-4 holding valve, my 3-4 command valve, and my 3-4 shift valve. And lastly, my 3-4 overlap valve. So this half of the valve body is pretty much dedicated to the 3-4 shift, shift group. <clears throat> On the other side of the valve body, I've got my main pressure regulators. This is the lubricating pressure regulator valve. It's an important valve. We're going to look at that pretty closely. And then this is the 2-3 overlap valve. It's got its own little plunger in there and a tiny little spring. So now I'm way over here at my valve body test station. And as you can see, I've got quite a few areas to check on these valve bodies. I've outlined in red ink all the different passages. And some of these passages, like on this lower valve body half, you actually have to go in there and stick a piece of foam in there to kind of block it off because when you try to vacuum check this area, it's going to bleed into this whole passage there. So I'm going to go ahead and sacrifice a earplug. And that can create a little foam barrier that I can kind of jam in there that will hopefully provide a temporary seal so I can vacuum check this. Go into sonics.com. They can give you a nice vacuum test guide that will identify all these passageways that you need to check. We're going to go ahead and look at this upper valve body first. I've already marked out all these passageways. And we just went through and calibrated the vacuum pump. So that way I'm getting 25 inches when this is plugged off and it's getting 5 inches when it's going through a 40 thousandths orifice. So at the bottom of this manual valve I'm getting 20 inches. This passage right here is the 2-3 overlap valve. It's getting 20 inches as well. This is also part of the 2-3 overlap valve. 21, 22 inches. This is an important one. This is part of the lubricating pressure regulator valve. And this is, you know, a brand new valve body, so I'm not expecting anything wrong, but that's 22 inches, but that one commonly wears out. This one here is the pressure regulator valve. Got about 21, 22 inches of vacuum there, and that's good. It's also the pressure regulator valve. Got 23 inches of vacuum. When I test this portion of the manual valve, I got to make sure I'm in a, the proper gear. I'm blocking off those passages. So I check to make sure the lands are contacting the valve body bore down there. This passage is part of the 3-4 command valve with 20 inches. Forgot to ink this one out, but this one is for the 3-4 holding pressure valve. 20, 21 inches. Here's one I'm going to have to block off with a little piece of foam. So I sacrificed a chunk of earplug that I can kind of jam in there in hopes that this provides a temporary seal. Then I'm getting about 23 inches on that one. This passage, this passageway here is for my 3-4 overlap valve. 20, 21 inches. Another check for my overlap valve. 20 inches. 
the end plug there. Looks pretty good, 23 inches. So these values are what you'd see on a brand new OE valve body that's never seen a mile on it. So if nothing else, I knew this was going to turn out okay, but if nothing else, we get to see what it's like from the factory. So just like on the upper valve body, there's going to be some passages that we're going to have to plug off using foam or some kind of equivalent plug. Plenty to check on the lower valve body, so we're going to start with the 1245 command valve. Really good seal, 23, 24 inches of vacuum. This is one where we had to put a little plug in there. Get 23 inches of vacuum on it. That's on the shift pressure valve for the uh, one, two, and four, five shift group. 22 inches of vacuum. So we've got our foam there for the one, two, four, five holding valve. We'll check it. Pretty good seal, 23 inches. Check the other end of that same valve. Good seal, 21, 22 inches. We've got our foam here for the one, two, four, five shift pressure valve, uh, shift valve. About 22 inches of vacuum on it. And I forgot to circle that one out, but this is also another spot you wanna check. About 18 inches of vacuum on that one, a little lower than the others. On uh, this passageway right here, got my one two four five overlap about 22 inches of vacuum this is more on the overlap valve right here for the one two four five I've got a little over 20 inches of vacuum on this end of the valve I've got a good solid 23 inches of vacuum this uh, is my shift pressure regulating valve 23 inches of vacuum this passageway is the Regulating pressure regulator valve. 22 inches. With this valve, with the B2 shift valve on this end, I actually have to put my finger on the back of the valve body to plug off an exhaust passage. And I'm getting 22 inches of vacuum on it, so that's still good. This other end of the B2 shift valve, 24 inches. Then this is going to be the 2 3 holding. Big surface area, I'm only getting 16 inches of vacuum on it. I've got my foam plug blocking off this part of the holding valve circuit. For 21 inches. I'm going to check out the command valve for the 2-3. It's good, 23 inches or, or greater. And this is the 2-3 shift pressure. 23 inches. The torque converter clutch dampener. I'm going to rob a little piece of foam there. There's a tiny little slit there to keep me from sealing off perfectly. Well, I'm getting 23 inches with that foam piece in there. Go on this end of the uh, re torque converter regulating valve. 19 inches and measuring the top of that regulating valve for the torque converter, and I got 23 inches. So as you can see, there were plenty of places to check for valve body wear. Uh, Sonics.com, if you go to their website, you can download for free the, the uh, test areas. And they give you links to all the different areas that directs you towards the valves that they sell, either ones that require reaming or ones that just drop in that allow you to kind of recondition your valve body, bring it to um, as new condition. So this valve body tested out perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with it. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it back together so I can put my transmission back together and call it done. Now there is gonna be this separate video that's up there. You can see it linked. And it's gonna cover all the aftermarket modifications from various different companies and what they do to improve this valve body or to bring an old worn out valve, valve body back to new conditions. So watch that video for the uh, aftermarket fixes to this transmission. This is just the lab unit, so I'm just going to go ahead and put it back together the way it looks. I'm not going to go ahead and wash the paint off, but um, if this was a live job, I definitely would. As far as this lower valve body is concerned, I'm going to put my filter screens back in where they belong. I've got my little check valve. I want to put the flat side of that little hockey puck facing up. It goes in that little spot right there. I have my four 
plastic check balls. And you go right into that spot, those spots right there. Kind of right along this line. Boop, 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 boop. I got my four steel check balls. One, two, three, four. Kind of like in a zigzag fashion right there. And I got my four steel check balls that go on this side. One, two, three, four. And now I'm going to go ahead and put this all back together. Remember this little pin that maybe fell out on you or that you took out early in the process? Well, that'll help us kind of align everything up. It slides right there. And our big honking spacer plate fits over there. And our valve body fits on right there. See that pin in there? That's what's kind of keeping everything centered. I don't know if you can see it real well, but on the conductor plate, this little nub right there fits into that hole and pushes that pin out enough for that detent to grab onto it and center on it a little bit. But also, before I tighten any single bolt, I'll get every bolt started. That makes sure that these parts are lined up perfectly and I'm not cocked a little bit to the side. When tightening the bolts down, it's always a good idea to spiral from the middle out when you're tightening them, and then when you loosen things, spiral from the outside in. Now, if you're persnickety like me, you'll put a little paint pen mark as you torque these down. So that way there's like no chance that you'll forget a bolt and leave it loose on accident. After you've torqued all the T27 valve body bolts down, Go back and torque these side plates down. Now, these only take 35 inch pounds of torque, so not much. Don't get carried away, they're little guys. So there are some simple tests that we can do before installing these solenoids to make sure they're still good. One is I could just check the resistance of the solenoids to kind of see if they compare to specification. I like to touch my meter leads together there to kind of get an idea of what the lead resistance is first. I've got two tenths of an ohm, so I'll take that into consideration. I check these. This is the torque converter clutch solenoid, and it's the lowest resistance out of all of them. It's about, the spec is about two and a half ohms. The line pressure and shift pressure solenoid should be about five ohms a piece. I'm getting 5.2, so that's right on the money. 5.2 on this one as well. Now these shift solenoids should be about four ohms of resistance. 4.3, 4.3, and 4.3. So these three are all the same. So electrically, the coils are fine. There's no opens or shorts that we can detect. We can also pump some air pressure into it. Now, there's a little disclaimer here. Uh, any pulse with modulating solenoid pumping air into it and energizing it with the power supply and hearing it move on and off. That test to make sure that that pencil is moving but really isn't checking to see if there's leakage or any other kind of issues that way. So um, it is kind of a limited test, but it is something you could do and you will be able to find a like a stuck solenoid. So it's still, in my opinion, a worthwhile test. So here I got my air nozzle regulated down to about 40 PSI. That way things aren't shooting out all over the shop. And you can see with the vacuum line pushed over the snout of that solenoid and putting air into it, it's not going anywhere. I don't hear anything, it's not coming out. So I could take a power supply, or in this case, I'm just gonna use a nine volt battery. And I'm gonna make contact with these terminals. So you can hear the solenoid has the ability to turn on and off and pass air. So. We know the pencil's not stuck on this one. So just like the torque converter clutch solenoid, I can do the same thing with these shift solenoids. I took this O-ring off on the end to kind of help me slide this uh, vacuum line on there. You can see if I pump air into it, nothing comes out. If I touch it with the battery, you can see it has the ability of turning on and off, so this solenoid is not plugged or restricted or stuck. And I could do the same thing with all three of those. 
Now on the shift pressure and line pressure solenoid, the end of it's a lot larger. I could use my air hose, but I'm gonna, I'd have to like step it up. I actually took this one a little step further and I machined out a little kind of plug to accept this. Put gauge on it. This is obviously above and beyond what anybody would have to do to make this happen. But with like all the other examples, I could just put air pressure into it. Now you will hear leakage like that. Now leakage is normal and when you energize it, you'll hear more leakage. So that's what you'd expect to hear with these pressure solenoids. Check the other one. So as you can see here, these solenoids test identically, which gives you an indication that that leakage is normal. Um, there is a tiny orifice in there, and I think it's designed to kind of bleed pressure. So in summary, we can check these solenoids using resistance checks. We can pump air through it, and we can energize them on and off just to make sure that they have the ability to open and close. But once again, it doesn't necessarily match the pulse with modulation to the pressure. So you could still have symptoms or issues um, that could be related to the solenoids, but yet still pass these tests completely. When you go to put the conductor plate on, it might feel like it doesn't want to snap in on this side. If you remember, there's that nub in there on the bottom of this conductor plate that kind of pushes this little centering pin out. So if you have it laying on the bench, that might keep you up and out of position. You could either just lift it, or you could pull this pin out actually and put it in later. A lot of times this pin ends up falling out anyway. Before I put these two solenoids in, the line pressure and shift pressure solenoid, I've got these little filter screens. There's one in each spot. They go down in there, kind of protect the solenoids from um, inhaling debris. So make sure you have one in each one of those spots. And we got our shift solenoids and our PWM torque converter clutch solenoid. Now we put our solenoid clamps in there. And last but not least, we'll put our little plastic covers over the solenoids. And then we have our valve body completely assembled. Now it's time to put it in the transmission. If you felt like making an air test plate for this, you can. Okay, grab yourself a little piece of paper and a pencil. And sit there and shave this in. So check this out. Now you got a perfect little template. You can lay this over a piece of flat aluminum stock. You could drill your bolt holes and you can drill for perfect circles for your K1, B1, K2 and torque converter clutch on the bottom. Can make a little plate with the B2, K3, and B3. Nice round holes that you can air check easy. So if you do these transmissions frequently, it might be worth taking a little bit of time and just go ahead and making yourself an air check plate. So I went ahead and made those air test plates because why not? It only took about a half of an hour and now they're built and they're done and I can use those if I feel like it, especially in a vehicle, it becomes kind of handy. If I want to check a clutch, I can put this plate in there and pump air into it. In using the original valve body bolts, I had to put these nuts under there to kind of work like spacers because the valve body is thicker than this plate and these bolts are a little too long. You can see I've got these labeled K1, B1, K2, torque converter clutch. I can actually check the torque converter clutch as a separate piston in the torque converter clutch and I can check it now using that plate and the B2, K3 and B3. Now, as I mentioned before, I like to air check things as I build it back up from scratch. And the reason why is because sometimes you get leakage around Teflon seals, the plastic ceiling rings. You don't know if it's leakage from a piston or from the ceiling rings, and it's supposed to or is gonna leak through the ceiling rings, uh, but it should not leak through the piston seals. So I like to, when you build it up, as we showed, kind of maybe replace the Teflon seals temporarily with O-rings or some kind of a seal so you can get a positive air check on those. But here, if I'm checking it through the case, I am going to expect to hear some leakage. So since we have to deal with that leakage, 
when we air check it, we usually use regulated air pressure down to about 30 to 40 PSI. The reason why we do that is if it will air check with 30 PSI of air, it should work fine under pressure with fluid. So I'm gonna check this K1, and remember this K1, it uses those Teflon sealing rings, and it's not gonna give you probably a pretty good air check at 30 PSI. I can kinda of hear the piston move a little bit. It thuds, but it doesn't sound like it's making a full stroke. The B1 clutch, it's a good seal. K2 clutch, I can hear it apply and there's a bit of leakage. I can spin the input shaft and that got me a lot better seal. Torque converter clutch, I don't have the torque converter on but that can go in and check the torque converter clutch. Here's the B2, nice seal. K3, I can hear the piston moving on it and B3. Good seal. So the air test plates do give you a little bit of uh, confidence when you go through this transmission and you air check everything. Everything seems to air check well. If you know your end plays are all good, your air checks are all good. If you're running into an issue with this transmission, it's more than likely the valve body or the electronics. And you can deal with that on the vehicle if you have to. So with this thing passing its air check, we can go ahead and take these air test plates off and install the valve body. When you put the valve body on, pay close attention to your manual valve and make sure it lines up with the pin on your shift linkage. If the valve body doesn't want to go in straight, check to make sure that this plastic nub right here on the manual valve is in the right spot. These bolts get torqued to 71 inch pounds. Now, if you took this pin out or left this pin out, remember this pin centers the top and the lower valve bodies, but it also serves to kind of center our detent assembly there. It only sticks out a little more than an eighth of an inch. So if it's sticking out further than that, you don't have these valve bodies centered. So make sure you put the pass-through connector in there. And the bolt on it is a seven millimeter. Now all we got left is our filter and we can put the pan on. There's a little tab that locates this filter side to side. And that completes the 722.6 overhaul video. Now don't forget that there are videos on the theory and operation of mechanical, electrical, hydraulic, torque converter clutch, and I have a separate video covering the details of the after, aftermarket modifications that they do to this valve body. So you can see that too. So thanks for watching.